Oh, hi, my name is Greg, and you're watching the latest uh, within a series of YouTube videos uh, that I've been producing uh, to tell my 1949 P3 Eurova restoration story. Uh, most of this series I've divided up into chapters that cover quite distinct parts of the restoration project. Uh, however, this video is going to be a little different. Uh, this video is a slightly modified version of a presentation uh, that I did for the Rover Car Club of South Australia early this year. Uh, club members asked if I'd do a presentation on my uh, P3 Rover restoration and of course I was more than happy to do that. Uh, but then I had to figure out how do I condense this uh, very big project into a 20 minute presentation. Uh, so to do that I've drawn on content from a number of my other videos in this series uh, as I attempt to really just give an overview of the whole project to date. Now, for those of you who've been watching this series, I have to apologize for not getting any content or any videos out rather for quite a long time now. Uh, as you can see, I'm alive and well, uh, but uh, I've been much busier than usual in my paid work and this has left me with uh, very little time and mostly very little energy to uh, devote to uh, making videos or, or to progress with my P3 Rover restoration. Uh, however, there is some good news on the horizon. Uh, I have some leave booked to start in a few weeks time. Uh, it'll be the first leave that I've taken in almost a year. Uh, given that there aren't too many places you can travel to at the moment, I'm uh, hoping to get some shed time in, uh, make some progress on my P3. Uh, and also I'm hoping to finish uh, several partially uh, completed videos that I've got uh, to add to this series, uh, get those uploaded. Anyway, without any uh, further introduction, I'll get on with this presentation now. I uh, hope you enjoy it and hope to see you at the end of the video. Uh, bye for now. Well, here's a slightly embarrassing photo. It's a photo of me when I was about 17 years old uh, with my first car, which, uh, as you can see, is a P4 Rover. I don't actually have many photos of my first car, but this is a photo of it uh, after I'd had it sort of fixed up and re-sprayed and pretty much how the car would have looked uh, during some of the early uh, Rover Car Club of South Australia car runs um, that I would have taken it on. So this is a photo I took of my P3 when I went to look at it for the first time. So there it is sitting in an old uh, garage there in uh, Snowtown of all places. Uh, if you look at the photo carefully, uh, you can see my reflection there in the window. And if you listen carefully, I think you can hear it calling me. Well, this car really fitted the bill for me. I wanted the four light version, or at least that was my preference. Uh, out of all the colors that the P3s came in, this was my favorite color. Uh, and I really wanted the restoration project and I certainly got that. When I first got the car home, I decided to try and find a fairly straightforward job first. Uh, so I decided to replace the floorboards. Uh, so here are my replacement floorboards uh, after, after they're partially progressed. Well, the next thing I focused on was replacing missing parts, and unfortunately there were quite a lot of missing parts to replace. Now this may seem like quite an obscure photo, and I guess it is, but it's a photo of part of the mechanical braking mechanism on a P3 Rover. Uh, P3 Rovers were a little unusual in that they had hydraulic brakes at the front and mechanically operated brakes at the rear, sometimes referred to as uh, rod operated. Uh, so this is a photo of that uh, part of that mechanical braking mechanism uh, that was missing on my car. Uh, Alvin, a fellow club member, was good enough to allow me to take photos uh, of his P3 Rover that's under restoration and also in some cases to actually borrow parts from him so I could take them home and uh, make drawings and uh, it really helped me a lot with uh, making parts. Now this is a corresponding part of my car after I'd done a fair bit of work in uh, manufacturing it myself. Uh, as you can see it's come along pretty well, I'm uh, quite happy with it. I won't go into any great details as to how I went about making it. I mean, I'm happy to do that at some other point or, or I can refer you to one of my uh, YouTubes. Now there is a part that's closely linked to that cross shaft which is uh, part of the mechanical braking mechanism uh, and that is uh, these two chassis rails which you can see in this photo that are painted in black. Now these chassis rails were also missing from my car. They're probably one of the first sort of really complicated uh, remanufacturing jobs that I did. Uh, they're more complicated than they look. They have a, like a Z section and they taper at various points along the length uh, from thick to thin and then back out again. Uh, they have bends in certain points that have got to be right and they have cutouts in certain points that have to be right. Uh, they have uh, captive nuts. Uh, so overall quite complicated. 
I was very lucky to have Alvin lend me a chassis rail from his P3 Rover, uh, which helped a great deal. I was able to take that chassis rail home, take some really detailed measurements of it, and then make my own drawings, and then go from there. This was one of those jobs where I'd sometimes wake up in the early hours of the morning with some bright idea about how to make these, and in some cases the idea wasn't that bright. Uh, but eventually I did figure out a way of doing it. I won't go into any great detail for this presentation, but, uh, because if I did, uh, we'd be here a very long time. At the front of this photo there are two seat rails that are borrowed from Alvin. Uh, these are the rails that the front seats slide backwards and forwards on. Again, uh, these parts were missing from my car. Uh, so at the rear of this photo you can see some copies that I made. One of the next things I wanted to focus on was just getting the engine running again. Uh, when I bought the car I was told that the engine uh, had run well when the car was last used, but the car was last used about 28 years ago. Uh, so I was just curious to get it running and see what it sounded like. So to get the engine running I adopted what I would refer to as a systems by systems approach. Uh, so initially I focused on uh, fixing everything to do with the cooling system and then focused on the ignition system and then focused on the fuel system and then eventually I ran out of systems. Again I won't go into too much detail here but certainly happy to talk about any of the work I did with anybody who's interested. Well it's probably hard to recognise what this is but what it is it's the casing off the generator on my car. Now as you may guess there's been a water leak uh, just above it which must have been happening for quite some time. Uh, these generators were originally a pretty high spec generator, part of the uh, Lucas Special Equipment range, and this one's looking very special. So I chipped and then ground all that rust out of the casing, and then welded up uh, the depression that was subsequently formed. Uh, so this uh, fixture uh, is an aid to me, sort of turning uh, it back down to size on my lathe. So the reason I went to the trouble of making this fixture is it allowed me to turn that whole length of the outside diameter in one go. These are the field cores from inside the generator. So the main piece of work I did with these was just to re-wrap them in some insulating tape. Here is one of the re-wrapped coils. This was really an exercise in bandaging uh, using skills from my second career. Well this is the finished generator after a lot of work. Uh, really happy with how it turned out, a really vast improvement on what it was. There are a few kind of milestones along the way in this overall project where I kind of look back and think, hey, oh, this is going okay, and this is one of those points. The next system I focused on was the fuel system, so here we have the fuel tank after a lot of work. The uh, fuel tank actually wasn't in bad shape, uh, inside there was no real corrosion, it was in pretty good shape, uh, so largely it was just a matter of stripping off the external finish and refinishing it. Now this is a fuel reserve valve which uh, I tried to overhaul but uh, in the end it seemed to be beyond redemption. Uh, so I ended up getting a reproduction one from a, a supplier in England. So here's my reproduction uh, fuel reserve valve alongside the original. I had the reproduction version made by a company in England called the Four Ashes Garage who mainly specialised in making reproduction parts for early model Aston Martins uh, but they also made this part for me uh, for my P3. So here's that fuel reserve valve fitted and looking very nice indeed. So here we have the fuel tank all ready to be refitted. You can get new SU electric fuel pumps which as far as I can see are more or less a reproduction of the original uh, so that's the option I took. Next up I got a, a very short um, video uh, of me starting the engine for the very first time. Probably the first time the engine had run in about 28 years. Well that was fun, but now on with the mechanical work. So the next thing I focused on was the front suspension. So quite a bit of work to do there overall. I had to replace anything that was made out of rubber, so there's quite a lot of rubber bushes in the front suspension. So next I'll cover some work on the brakes. Uh, like most parts of this car, I had a few surprises. So this looks pretty good now. This is uh, one of the front drums, uh, but when I first took the drum off, there were no brake shoes there at all. I mean, I don't mean they were worn out, they just weren't there at all. 
So unfortunately, I was able to get some second-hand brake shoes from a chap in the UK. Uh, so once I got all the components of the brake system stripped off the car, I took everything to power brakes at Holden Hill, and they uh, relined the brake shoes, uh, re-sleeved uh, brake cylinders, and got the rear mechanical brakes working again as well. So whilst I was at it, I also had uh, power brakes make up some new brake lines for me, uh, using the original ones as a template. Another fairly obscure photo, I suppose, but this is the battery box that sits under the back seat. Uh, so here I'm using a special drill bit for drilling out spot welds. Well, I said about removing it because, well, it was a wee bit rusty, as you can see. Uh, so what I wanted to do was remanufacture it, which uh, turned out to be a really interesting job for me because I'd never really done anything quite like that before. So the main challenge was just doing this sort of form section in the steel panels, which is largely about sort of stiffening the panels. Uh, I think that would normally be done on a machine called a bead roller, which I didn't happen to have a bead roller. So I did some research on YouTube and I found a technique sort of using plywood formers uh, and a pneumatic chisel, which I did have. So here's one of the side panels finished. Not perfect, but good enough. I mean, at the end of the day, it gets painted and it sits underneath the car. Well, here's the moment I've been working uh, towards for a while. Uh, I've got the painted battery box in situ now, uh, and I'm gonna work on welding it in. So I've, I've drilled out holes in various places where I do uh, plug welds, and I've uh, prepped the, the surfaces where the welds will happen with a uh, product called Weld Through Primer. Well, my next big sort of remanufacturing job was uh, relates to the rear suspension. Uh, so if you look at this diagram, there's a bar towards the top of it, which is part of the rear suspension that the rear springs attached to. Uh, so I refer to it as a spring bar. Uh, so this diagram is from the Rover Sports Registers part manual. Well, this photo clearly shows why I had to remanufacture it. Uh, as you can see, it's a wee bit rusty. Uh, jumping a long way ahead now, in this photo you can see my re remanufactured uh, spring bar in the vise and behind it uh, the original spring bar. This photo just shows uh, some plates that I made which are part of a bracket uh, assembly which in turn is a part of this overall spring bar assembly. I'm just going to move on now and show an excerpt from one of my YouTube videos which I hope explains how I went about making this spring bar. But more importantly I think it just gives an example of the problem solving uh, and just breaking the job down into sort of manageable chunks. Okay, I've got the original world of the assembly in my vice now, and I'm just going to give a bit of an overview of the whole job. And would you believe it uh, ends up being uh, more time consuming and uh, complex than I expected, but uh, that's all right, I kind of enjoyed it to be honest. Um, so I'll just go through how I kind of figured out a way of reproducing it. So I'll just have a bit of a scan overall here. I've made a few changes to um, the original, I and mean, I've chopped off uh, a section on the end here, uh, and I, I did cut through there and also through here and I've sort of tack welded it back together in it again now. The reason I did that is I wanted to uh, sort of separate it into sort of component parts. So as a way of making it, uh, I've decided to uh, separate, uh, actually I might go to the other end, it's a little easier. Um, so I decided to separate this sort of bracket structure into three main parts. Uh, so this big end plate, uh, a top plate, and then a small end plate. Now when it was originally made, I kind of assumed this stuff would have been stamped out on, on a press. Uh, so this top plate and side plate were one piece, and you can see they've been welded together there. Uh, it was a little hard to reproduce that, so I've, uh, as I've explained, I've done it in three, three parts. Uh, I use uh, this hole to my advantage in certain ways as, as well. Uh, so when I was making the top plate, I made a, uh, a form tool like so, uh, with a, a locator pin in it uh, that located on that hole. 
Uh, so this form tool just forms the, the rounded edges uh, that uh, are part of this top plate. I also used that hole to my advantage when I was, I'll just put this on here, uh, because I was making this as three separate parts I had to be careful uh, to get the angle that this uh, top plate um, was uh, welded to uh, at in relation to uh, other parts of the bracket structure uh, so I made this I guess you call it a setting tool uh, that uh, uh, gives me that angle uh, what else did I make I made a very crude uh, setting tool also to get uh, the angle of this bracket in relation to that face correct I have my almost finished spring bar here uh, the bracket that you can see extending from the end uh, is a bracket uh, that supports part of the exhaust system. I have to say this was probably one of the most technically difficult parts of the restoration project that I did myself, uh, but also one of the most satisfying parts to finally get done. There are also some shackle assemblies that were part of this overall sort of spring bar assembly. I was able to salvage a part of the original, uh, but also turned up some uh, new pins and bits and pieces. There are also some bushes known as silent block bushes uh, which were worn out which I had to replace. I wasn't that happy with the replacement ones you could buy so uh, you, you guessed that I went about making my own. Again I won't go into too much detail here. Suffice to say the most challenging part of turning up these bushes was uh, turning the polyurethane rubber. Uh, as with most aspects of this overall restoration uh, I can refer you to one of my YouTubes if, you, if you'd like more detail. So this photo shows the disassembled original bush in the back. Uh, on the right there's a bush uh, that I bought that I wasn't that happy with. And on the left uh, there's my homemade version uh, which I was happy with. And here's the finished bush after I press fitted it into the shackle assembly. I'll cover very briefly the body restoration work that I had done by Finch Restorations out at Mount Barker. The original plan was to leave the body on the chassis. Uh, but as we found more and more rust, uh, that plan had to change. Uh, so body off the chassis here, which allowed the body shell to be taken for abrasive blasting, uh, which of course revealed the full extent of the rust, uh, but also then revealed the full extent of the work required uh, to get things back into real top shape. Now I skipped over a massive amount of rust repair to get to this point where the body shell was in primer. So whilst I had the car in for body repairs, I busied myself getting the chrome work done. Uh, I took everything to A-class metal finishers out at Lonsdale and uh, very happy with the work that they did. So here's one of the side lights all re-chromed and reassembled. I'll tell a little bit of a story about a, a spring clip that holds that front lens in place, which I made myself. So inside that side light you have this uh, metal bracket. And if you look at the front of it, there's a lot, like a sort of spiky bit there, which is actually a spring clip. So these are the original ones, which uh, in this photo you, you don't get the full idea, but they actually were pretty rusty and they've become shortened in length because the tips had rusted away. So I decided to make my own spring clips because I couldn't find any to buy anywhere. Again, I won't go into too much detail here, but I made a little jig to bend the spring steel while around to get the shape that I wanted. And then I had to temper the spring steel. I came up with what I think is a fairly innovative way of uh, tempering the spring steel clips uh, that is in my Weber barbecue. Uh, you could say it's the Aussie way of doing it. So how this works is you wrap the spring steel clips in a bundle of steel wool and then you wrap that in alfoil and then you need to hold it that at a, a right temperature for the right amount of time and that has the effect of relieving the internal stress within the spring steel uh, so you end up with a more resilient spring in the end. Well, uh, back to the body shop now, or the spray booth to be more precise. Uh, I asked them to give me a phone call when the car was back in green. Uh, so I visited the workshop on this day. Very exciting day for me to see these parts uh, looking the way they do. Well, by this stage I'd run out of money, so I had the Finch Restoration boys put the, uh, the body back on the chassis and just sort of roughly bolt everything back together so that I could get the car back home more or less in one piece. Now I hugely underestimated the amount of work involved in this reassembly. 
Uh, I won't go into any great detail here because, again, it would take all night. Uh, I decided to more or less start at the back of the car, so I refitted the fuel tank, uh, the lights, and I, I got some of the chrome bits on. Uh, largely, I was just curious to see what it looked like. There's quite a lot of bits and pieces of repair work along the way as I was reassembling. Uh, so one of the early jobs I did when I got the car back home was to sort of fix these brackets that support the front and rear bumpers. Uh, both were fairly badly bent out of shape and they required quite a bit of persuasion to get back into shape. So the rear bumper bar bracket back in shape now. I also made a bracket because uh, I wanted to add uh, flashing indicators so you can see that here as well. I made some door check straps which prevent the doors from opening too far. I had to do that because I only had two, so two were missing, uh, and the two that I did have weren't in great shape. So now for something completely different. Uh, whilst I had the car with fence restorations, I had some repair work done on the interior timber trim. Uh, in one corner of the dash, I had some wood rot, which I had repaired. I did the refinishing and the staining myself, and then I had the instruments refurbished by a chap out at uh, Strathalbyn. Also fitted a new wiring loom that I had made by a company in the UK called uh, Autosparks. The original wiring loom here, where the original colour coding had mostly faded to the same colour. And now the new wiring loom. If you're interested in how I went about fitting it, I did cover that in one of my YouTubes. So back to the interior timber trim now. I stripped all that back and then uh, refinished in uh, polyurethane finish. Oh, and I forgot to mention, when I was redoing the wiring, I added a power isolation switch, which I mounted uh, on the firewall there. Now, there's just one other thing I'd like to cover in relation to the car electrics, and that is my combination of flashing indicators and flashing trafficators. I cover how I set up the car to have both in one of my YouTubes. So out with the car now, just checking out the indicators and the trafficators. So at this stage of progress, I only have the rear flashing indicators wired up. Uh, so here you can see one of them flashing, working nicely, and now back to the trafficator, and that's flashing as well. Uh, so they're happy with that. I'll finish off with some fairly current photos. I've still got a little bit of work to do, uh, a bit of adjustment to get the doors to shut properly, and a little bit of uh, panel adjustment work to do at the front. Uh, and then it's off to the motor trimmer. So hoping to get it all done this year. So, so this is where the car is up to now. The most recent work I've done is uh, refitting the front and rear windscreens, uh, refitting the sunroof, and putting new rubber on the running boards. Uh, well, hi again. I hope you found this uh, presentation interesting. I did cover quite a bit of territory, uh, but uh, trust me, I did my best to condense it. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, I have a few partially uh, completed videos, which I hope to finish uh, when I'm on leave soon. Uh, so these upcoming videos will cover work uh, that I've done in uh, fitting new rubber mats on the running boards. I'll also get a video out uh, covering work that I've done in uh, refurbishing the sunroof. I think that'll be of interest to a few people. Uh, other videos will cover work that I've done in uh, refurbishing the instrument panel, uh, the glove boxes. And then after that, I'll probably uh, progress with uh, videos covering just general assembly work, including the work that I'm currently doing on uh, refitting uh, the freewheel cable to the gearbox. Uh, so I hope to see you in another video and uh, bye for now.